Good. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next edition of this wonderful lecture series. Uh, it is my great pleasure today to introduce to you Carlo Rovelli, who obtained his PhD in Italy and moved on from postdoctoral positions in the US, Yale, and Pittsburgh. Now is a professor in Aix Marseille, leading a rather large quantum gravity group. Um, the achievements, I won't list them all, but most of you here will know some aspects of the work. He's one of the co-founders of Loop Quantum Gravity. He worked on physics without time, eliminating this mysterious parameter. He came up with relational quantum mechanics, a way of interpreting in a self-consistent way uh, quantum measurements and quantum mechanics itself, and has written many acclaimed books on uh, the philosophy of science and quantum mechanics and the nature of gravity. And so, without further ado, I will ask Carlo here to tell us about scientific realism. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> this nice introduction. Thank you, um, all of you, for being here. In fact, so, so numerous. I was expecting a small class. I found a great audience. It's fantastic. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about quantum mechanics, <coughs> and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, scientific realism. Um, a little bit mostly, I will talk about what I call relational um, quantum mechanics. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what it is. Um, which is uh, uh, one of the many possible perspectives from which you can view uh, this strange beast, which is a uh, quantum theory. Um, so, let, let me start from uh, just a few words about the, the general problem. Uh, quantum theory, uh, of course, works fantastically well. The great news is always, oh, quantum mechanics works. Uh, and it goes out in the newspapers and kind of find out that it works the way we expected it to work. Uh, but the uh, range of different opinions about how to think about quantum mechanics uh, is, uh, is staggering. People talk in a convincing, convinced way about quantum mechanics as saying opposite things about the world. Okay? So I will not try to define what the problem of quantum mechanics is, uh, just listen to different people um, go to Vienna, go to Oxford, and you get completely different stories about quantum mechanics, what quantum mechanics is about, and what it's saying about the world, and how to think about it. Uh, I'm not going to solve the problem. <laughs> I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about the landscape of views about uh, quantum mechanics, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll insist um, on uh, this particular way, traditional quantum mechanics, which uh, I'll, I want to present it just as a, um, in, in a family of similar uh, interpretations, which are, to some extent, refinements of uh, the so-called, vaguely called Copenhagen interpretation um, of quantum mechanics. There's no Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. There are things written by Bohr, by Heisinger, uh, by others, which differ from one another. There are textbooks. There's a sort, sort of consistent story in uh, quantum mechanics textbooks um, that makes many people unhappy. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, there are variants of, of, of that, including uh, relational quantum mechanics, and including, of course, the idea of uh, Anton Zeilinger, which is there, who came out roughly at the same time and has a lot of com in common, uh, but some differences with what I'm, um, I'm going to, uh, to say here. So, relational quantum mechanics originated in a paper in '96, so it's quite some time now, uh, a lot of time. For a while, it was pretty much ignored by everybody. Uh, uh, I was very disappointed because I thought it was a great idea and it just went completely flat. Uh, but then papers uh, started, came out about it, first from philosophers, <coughs> then from physicists, then from mathematicians. It sparked uh, a number of uh, uh, different uh, uh, 
works. Um, and uh, I would say now is in, on, the, on the table among, among the possible, possibly consistent, but with a price, I'll come to that, um, ways of looking um, into quantum mechanics. Uh, one of the things that started uh, is, is, is a variant of the problem of the reconstruction of quantum mechanics from a sim simple set of physically motivated postulates. There have been remarkable advances in that direction, um, particularly Philip, Philip Hearn, and uh, I will not go much into that, I just I will mention that at, the, at, the, uh, at some point. Information plays a role in, the, in, the, in this discussion. Um, and this connects what uh, Anton Zeidinger has been saying for a long time, I will be more specific. So that's just as an introduction. Let me start by uh, saying what, what is the problem of quantum mechanics by listing different ways of viewing the theory. <clears throat> and I think very roughly one can find four interpretations that today are most discussed. Um, how should I write them here? So one, as I said, is the whole Copenhagen um, interpretation, in which um, essentially you think about systems. That's that's the way. That's what the, what is written in textbooks, right? The quantum systems, where they are, uh, system. Um, and according to the to the textbook story, you measure them. So there is some observer. With some apparatus, so which is a classical uh, description, nothing quantum mechanical there, which make a measurement and come out uh, from the measurement with some values qn of some quantities that describe the system. Right? The spin is up of this particle, or the spin is down at some time. But then, if you have uh, enough of this uh, qn at some time, you can actually predict what you will measure at some later time, so q, q tilde n, at some later time, q prime, or q, q at some q prime, um, by writing a wave function and uh, making an evolution, and then there's a collapse. Um, or less, I, that's what you read in textbooks to quantum mechanics. And of course, there are, uh, well, all kind of now, a second, completely different way of looking at the story, um, which is very popular today among uh, some people doing cosmology, some uh, spin theorists, the brain spin theorists, uh, all the philosophers in Oxford, Oxford is the center of that, but also some philosophers somewhere else. <coughs> uh, it's a whole main world. Each one of these um, interpretations come in variants, right? So uh, keep this with a grain of salt. So the idea is that there's no observer, there's no special QN, there's no collapse, nothing of the sort. There is this quantum state, wave function, which evolves unitarily in time. And that's it. And from this universal wave function that evolves in time, all the rest follows, you just have to be sufficiently smart of read out of this quantum universal wave function or quantum universal state, read out all the command, including probabilities, including the values, including measurement, including collapse, <coughs> everything. And the main idea <coughs> is that um, the wave function never collapse, so if you have a if you're measuring the spin of a particle <coughs> to a tangela, uh, the wave function has actually <coughs> two branches, one spin up, say, that goes up, one spin down, say, that goes down, and when you measure it, you yourself, your wave function, get entangled, so the, the universe as a whole branches in two, and why we see only one? Because we're just, we happen to be sitting in one of the two, so the actual spin up or spin down is perspectival, depending where you are, okay? The third family of interpretations is Bohmian version. <laughs> where uh, the idea <clears throat> is that yes, there is a universal wave function, but there's also a continuous value of all the physical variables 
In fact, not all the physical variables, some physical variables, not all of them, say position and not momentum, for instance. So you have the, for a particle, for instance, you have the wave and the particle, you both have. And uh, uh, Bohm, somehow following the lead of the De Broglie, uh, found nice equations for the particle um, once you have a wave function that solves the Schrodinger equation. So this solves the Schrodinger equation as its own dynamics, unit dynamics, and in the wave function, there is a particle that moves and is guided by psi, and given psi, you can find the equation for, for Q, and it turns out that the theory, what you see is Q, and uh, it turns out that the theory is actually uh, equivalent. The prediction of the theory are equivalent to the prediction of particle mechanics. The fourth and last in this super simplified list of approaches, it's a, a physical collapse. And here, rather than interpretation, I should rather say physical collapse theory or theories, plural. Because uh, um, this is a number of approaches that actually say, well, collapse doesn't make sense in terms of quantum standard quantum mechanics. Uh, it has to be understood physically as a physical process, mainly as a correction of the wave of the Schrodinger equation. Schrodinger equation is the unit of evolution of the wave function, but actually, let's imagine that the Schrodinger equation is not the whole story, it has other terms, nonlinear terms, such that the wave function of a particle, say, once in a while, it collapses in some point, following some, uh, some dynamics. The two, the two most well-known variants of it are um, uh, WGR, Weber Girardi Rimini, which they have an actual mechanism that does that, and Penrose, which has uh, some unwaving arguments that uh, gravity does its job. Once you try to put, uh, one, once a quantum system interacts with gravity, space-time, if the space-time goes in a quantum superposition, it doesn't want to be in a quantum superposition too much, so as soon as you quantum superpose space-time too much, boom, it collapses to just one, so it keeps collapsing. So these are the, that's what most is on the table. And I'm sure you all, many of you will think, oh, you're missing this one, or you're missing this other, but that's mainly the ones which are most discussed, we want. When you go to a conference on the decision part of the kind of future at the end is a board. These are the ones that make many votes for clients. So uh, let's make it concrete. Uh, suppose I had a, a radioactive particle, a piece of uranium, uh, a radioactive piece of something there, and I have some standard, so, sorry, some Geiger counters here. You, you, you wait for a while, some initial time is zero, you, this is still reactive, and some later time one of these clicks. Click. Okay, not the others. So, according to the first story, well, you first have some measurement of this, and then some later on you have some measurement of this clicking. And uh, you do your, your, your calculation, you have a wave function that uh, you can, you can make, model this with a particle inside a box with a potential uh, that traps it, uh, but the potential is finite height, so you can tunnel out. And so the, the wave function leaks out. So the wave function is all over, right? <coughs> That's actually the first discussion given by Einstein about the problem before EPR, before anything else, then from here we go to EPR. And then, um, at some point, there's, there's always a probability that some of these clicks, this clicks, and at some point, whoop, this disappears. Suddenly, that's a collapse, and the particle is here, the wave function is concentrated there, and then it's not again the shade of the So that's the Copenhagen story. The main world story is that there is this wave, Okay, and then um, at each time there's a probability of one of these to click. So at each time the world splits in different universes, 
and at each time it splits uh, according to whether one of the known is clicked or one is clicked, so they are all possible universes, all real, and if you go to Oxford, you really believe that, it's wrong. <laughs> I mean, Simon Sanders, uh, David Wallace, all these people really believe that. There are all this enormous number of universes, and they tell you that unless you believe that, you don't believe in realism, so you're not a realist. Um, so, uh, this uh, detector here is not, hasn't clicked, it's just there are many, many worlds in which in, in some of this it has and some of this it hasn't. It's a continuous of world, uh, and there is a long, complicated story from this continuous of world to talk about probability, so we talk about observability. The Bohemian story, the Bohemian story would be totally convincing if there was only one particle in the world, but there are many particles in the world. But the Bohemian story is that there is the, there is the, the wave governed by the Schrodinger equation, but there is also a particle that moves uh, guided uh, by the wave, so no surprise that we see the particle at some point. Why there is not just a particle? Because of course, if you put something with two holes here, uh, then uh, where the particle arrives depends on interference. So just a particle alone doesn't work. So the Bohmian idea is that of course there is the wave because of interference, but there is also the particle because you see the particle in one point. And the physical collapse story is what I said before. So the, the wave function starts, but then Suppose this particle is sufficiently heavy, at some point uh, uh, the wave function just boom, concentrated here, and then boom, concentrated here, and then is clicked here. So more or less, I'm just making a cartoon of this uh, story. You see, there are completely different stories about what happened in the, in the, in the world. Um, they are all good, and in fact, for each one of this story, there are very smart scientists that believe them like a religion. And they're ready to fight the older energies for them. And uh, they're very smart philosophers that believe them that that's the only possible way of doing it. So they're not contradictory, they're all, they're all possible. Uh, but for each of these stories, there are a lot of other people, usually many more, who just think this nonsense. So it's a strange situation. Why, why are we in this situation? Because each one of these perspectives forces you to accept uh, something. Each one comes with a price, a cost. It could be a philosophical cost, it could be a physical cost, cost of different kind, uh, which everybody else, the people who don't like that particular perspective, consider it too high a price to pay in order to make sense of my demands. So let's go through this very, very rapidly for each one of, the, of, these, um, of these interpretations. And let's see what the cost. Cost. Um, let's start from here. Well, the, the price here is that uh, you which is a standard way of presenting things, at least, uh, is that uh, this guy and his apparatus are treated uh, classically and not quantum mechanically, which is disturbing. I mean, it was okay in the 30s when we just invented quantum mechanics, but now we know the world is quantum mechanics as a whole. Why can't we give a quantum mechanical description? But even more, um, all the idea is that there's a measurement. Now, oh, the, the very idea of founding a description of the world uh, in terms of measurement, uh, in, you know, it may appeal to people who does experiment in laboratory. I'm not going to do that. But I'm a theoretician who want to describe the full universe. Uh, okay, where well, there are no measurements, I mean, on, on Andromeda, presumably, I don't know, but if there are nobody will make a measurement, what's going on? When is a measurement done? What counts as a measurement? Unless this is said clearly and clearly, the thing is, is, is shit. You want a theory that works about the uh, early universe, about galaxy formations, that quantum mechanics affect all over. When does it count as a measure? Of course, it can be cleaned up, but that's the point. 
I want to clean this up. Right. Um, so what is what is the measurement? And what is an observer? And of course, here immediately you see that uh, philosophy comes in because if you are a realist, uh, if you are a naturalist, much less than a realist, uh, if you believe that we humans are just part of nature and we have to understand ourselves just a, a part of, of everything else, and it is complicated, uh, then uh, you cannot start with fundamental theory by putting a subject. If you're in Germany, uh, or in a German-speaking country, and idealism has been the dominant philosophy for a few centuries, uh, um, you think the subject, uh, it's, uh, it, it's before everything else, so everything refers to, you know, you come from feet, shelling, tail, uh, then it's completely natural that you think in terms of the subject. Okay. Um, but even German philosophical world is a big world. Reaction against this form of idea is you know, when, when you think about the world, not when you think about the theory of knowledge. Um, so, do we really want the physical theory that requires a mind which is sort of outside the humans to think about it? And, 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 and we a priori cannot describe this mind in, 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 in natural terms. So, you see immediately there's a, there is a, um, a philosophical side of it, but it's clear that there are some costs here. Now, what about the main world <coughs> that the Oxford crowd likes so much? Well, the, the, the cost is huge, because you have to believe in all these extra universes, extra world, equally real as us, just to make sense of what happens here, with just a spin that, the particle that goes up and hits the screen. So, the cost here, is, I would say, one, a, a, a hugely, hugely uh, inflated uh, ontology. Worlds and worlds and worlds. But I think the, 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 the difficulty is stronger. This is always said, but I think there's a stronger difficulty, which is what are the actual QN? What is the particle being here exactly out of the pure wave function. This is a long technical detailed discussion, but I think, uh, I don't think they have succeeded in spite of the beautiful books by David Wallace, by uh, Sanders and my others. I don't think if you just have the wave function, you out of that you can deduce this is a glass here. There's no glass here in the wave function. The Bohmian theory is wonderful. This uh, has a fantastic, first of all it's deterministic. You, you, you have the thing you see, you have the thing that satisfies the training equation, it seems wonderful, until you go into it. Once you go into it, you find two difficulties. One is that it's a funny determinism, it's a funny realism, where there's a part of reality which is hidden from you in principle. Okay? So the determinism comes from the fact that it's impossible to have knowledge about this and that from what you observe. So, uh, it, it's strange price, realism, when it's hidden by the theory itself. So, hidden <coughs> uh, part of reality. But worse, uh, once you try to make it work, you have to break Lorentz invariance badly, and uh, you have a lot of difficulties of just working out spin um, this wave function is not in space-time, but is in configuration space. For quantum theory, this is a, a, a function of the space of all fields, okay? And then you don't know exactly what these are, because the people who do Bohmian for quantum field theory are confused how to do it. It's, for a physicist, it just smells wrong all the way through. You have to believe that there's a wave function that actually determines things instantaneously in a fixed Lorentz frame, um, that is in principle undetectable. It's just bad physics. So it uh, smells wrong. <laughs> and the physical collapses theory, well, I mean, if there was a hint, an empirical, experimental, whatever suggestion that actually the collapse happened, but there isn't. I mean, you can make a parameter there and make the parameter as small as, as invisible as, 
uh, as you can. So there is no, uh, no uh, empirical support whatsoever. And frankly, none of these theories look very appealing as a, as, as a theory of nature. Once you look at them, they are sort of proof of principles that something like that might work. But Pagel's theory, you cannot make it precise. People have tried. And uh, WGR, you can make it precise, but come on. I mean, this is expertise that. Again, these are not, nothing of this is deadly. And in fact, none of this is dead. But each one of these are strong reasons for which many people don't believe in this document. This document. <coughs> so that was part one. And now let me come to um, the relational story, uh, which I would, like Seidinger's idea, uh, frame as a, a version of Copenhagen when we try to solve and take away the ugliness of, of, of Copenhagen and make it consistent. So I would, I would put inside here both uh, Anthony Hughes and, and um, Arthur and that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, to talk about that, I'll start from some history. And this is going to be hard because uh, I'm in Vienna, I'm in Austria, and I have to say something bad about Schrader. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how I thought they say something about the type of the code that they're having. So, um, but I, uh, I'm going to do it. So here's the story. Schrader in 19... Uh, was it 26, wrote a paper, of course, in which he wrote, um, he did something fantastic out of sort of first principles, he computed the spectrum of the hydrogen atom, right? Boom. And all this is based on uh, uh, an equation, um, which you all know, uh, except I probably got all the sign wrong or whatever. I'm writing one dimension, uh, so I don't have to put uh, whatever, plus. Uh, where all this is for this beautiful quantity, which introduces there is a function in space and time, which is a wave function. Okay? And out of this uh, modulus is a spectrum of uh, hydrogen. Of course, uh, you have to do the three dimension to the right potential one over R. Well, except that in 1925, this had already been done. In fact, quantum mechanics, as we study today in textbooks, okay, Breaker, Ibanez, uh, Lucian, everything, including the spectrum, was done before 1926. Right? Was done by a bunch of people, first of all by Heisenberg, who in the in 1925, I wrote the paper that actually started quantum mechanics, incredible paper, just mind-blowing paper. Uh, and uh, shortly after, he himself, so Heisenberg, uh, plus uh, Jordan, who had the misfortune of being an Nazi and so not having a good press in his life and then uh, the world, um, developed the theory in a sequence of papers, which are incredible. There's all angular momentum theories, everything in this paper. It's just what you find in modern textbooks of quantum mechanics is in those papers, everything computer. And, and they have, in fact, one idea, the, the, the main equation, right, P, Q, commutator, P, I, H, R, I'm not sure of the sign, uh, minus, 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 doesn't matter. And if you start from this equation, plus uh, h equal uh, p squared over 2m plus v of q, okay, and you find the values of this uh, where the two operator satisfies that, in principle you find the spectrum of hydrogen. Not in principle, because it was found that it was computed by Pauli. It, it, it's not an easy calculation, you know the story. They tried, they tried hard, three of them, and, they, and then they said, because already Heisenberg and, uh, and uh, uh, 
and Born had asked Pauli to help them to do this paper. And Pauli said, no, no, I have more interesting things to do. Uh, but then when they wanted to compute, the, uh, they put here the uh, 1 over r, and they wanted to compute the, the spectrum of the hydrogen. It was horrendously complicated, this calculation. So they, they went back to Pauli and said, can you help us? And Pauli said, ah, that's too hard for you. <laughs> <laughs> and he did That's how. And, uh, and in the middle, of course, the Iraq also got the paper by Heisenberg and had the full, the full uh, 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 understanding of the relation between this and the Poisson bracket and the idea that the, alien, uh, the, the observable quantities are the uh, AA values uh, of uh, uh, the, the greater the half of the radius. So it's, it's all. What has Schrodinger done? Well, I got the long ones. And uh, Einstein suggested he from the heat and Einstein got the long ones. So it's not, it's not nothing. Uh, but from this perspective, what has he done? First of all, he has transformed a hard algebraic problem in a language that at the time the physicists were completely unaware of. You know that Heisenberg had no idea what matrices are. Now we do linear algebra at school, but Heisenberg didn't know what these things are. He just put in this system, invented this thing of multiplication without knowing what it is. Already studied by mathematicians. Jordan had told Heisenberg. <coughs> So it was, this is a very hard mathematics in the 30s, in the 20s, uh, for the physicists. Um, even today, people are not at ease with non-commutative algebras. But that's non-commutative algebra, right? You have non-commutative algebra, and you compute spectrum of equators here, non-commutative algebra. Uh, so Schrodinger, without knowing that, because he did it independently, I believe, uh, he translated a, 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 a tough algebraic problem in a nice partial differential equation problem, which is the language that everybody knew at the time, because of Maxwell equations, because of um, heat equation, because of all the stuff that uh, the French mathematician, et cetera, et cetera, has done. Uh, uh, Maxwell and all the way else. So first of all, he translated uh, into decent mathematics, and he gave an intuitive picture of what goes on. Because this is something very simple, right? Instead of the electron, you have a wave. A wave, and then the connection with what you measure was not completely clear, but, but, but you know, wave. So immediately, it did catch on. People, it's much easier to do computation with the Schrodinger equation than doing computation with that, just to go. Immediately, Heisenberg started complaining. Saying, what the hell? This has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. Uh, you're wrong. And he saw immediately the difficulties. So difficulty being, first of all, that the nice idea that this is a function in space and time just is dead as soon as you have two particles. It's not a function of space and time anymore, it's a function of configuration space. It's a function of x and y. So it's a function of many legs. Okay? Um, but it's more than that. The connection between this and the views, and what you see, it's far from obvious. The discussion was raged for, for, for very strongly at the time, and Schrodinger, who, let me now try to wake up, has been one of the clearest minds in this discussion. He's one of the people who more clearly uh, went through the full discussion of the linear quantum mechanics. This is what he writes in the, the 50s, much later. This is from a conference he gave in, in, in Dublin. It's Schrodinger. He says, the, creator, the creators of wave mechanics, he, well, <laughs> the, creator wave. the creators of wave, wave mechanics, lulled themselves for some time in the hope of having cleared the way to a classical physics like description of a continuum. <coughs> right? We thought we could have transformed everything just as a continuous. <coughs> but, this is really, the hope turned out to be false. Nature rejected the continuum description. 
And then from the same text, you know, the paragraph, this continuity reappears in the connection between the way of representation and the observed facts. Um, there is no unequal correspondence between the two. In other words, if you just have the Schumann equation without the projection possible, without any value possible, without the facts possible, without all the rest of it, which is actually the, the core of quantum mechanics, you don't have quantum mechanics. Um, Schrodinger talks about continuity and discontinuity, <coughs> and I think this is a bit crucial. And I want to, here, before entering in the actual discussion of relation of quantum mechanics, let me say something about discontinuity. I am shocked by the fact that many of these, uh, many of the discussions about quantum mechanics uh, forget the discreteness which is core in quantum mechanics. The name of quantum mechanics comes from the discrete. The levels of the electron atom are discrete. The photons are granular manifestation of light in some appropriate sense. Um, angular momentum is quantized. Discrete is all over the quantum mechanics. In fact, one can make this more precise. In phase space, if you know that the system is in a region of phase space, finite dimensional region of phase space, say one dimensional system, okay, and you have a quantity that measure where in this region the system is, uh, this quantity can only take a finite number of values. Why? Because the dimension of phase space is the action, right, it's PQ, and uh, each bar <coughs> is the unit action, H bar is sort of the smallest region in phase space where you can shrink squeeze your knowledge of where the system is. So any quantity that tells you, wait, for instance, I don't know, the energy, um, you know that um, a, a pendulum has an energy less than some quantity. How many alternative states would there be? Well, that's a finite region of phase space, so there's a finite number of possible distinguishing alternative uh, states, therefore energy has discrete values. Okay. This is universal, this is general quantum theory. So discreteness is a core of quantum theory, and it's completely, all these views are completely uh, blind to discreteness. They try to recover it way, way, way ahead. There's no discreteness inside, unless you put it in the interpretation. Of course there's discreteness on the value side, but the connection between the energy and the frequency, it's something else, it's not three dimensional. So continue, continue to this core. No, oh, sorry, this continue. This core. Good. <coughs> all this was introduction, then it goes through. But, but all this, of course, served to introduce the main idea of relational quantum mechanics. So, what are the main idea of relational quantum mechanics? The main one is forget the show, forget the way function. Forget the idea that the wave function is an actual description of what is happening there. I, 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 I believe that in Vienna, this message can go through a little bit better than elsewhere in the world. Because in many parts of the world, if you go to um, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Santa Barbara, um, uh, uh, Boston, or New York, people look like, okay? People say, quantum mechanics is a wave function. What else? Okay? Quantum mechanics is a Schrodinger equation. What else? There's nothing else than the Schrodinger equation wave function. I believe that this is totally misleading and is actually the source of our confusion about quantum mechanics. The source of our confusion about quantum mechanics, I think, is taking the wave function as the thing there. Wave function is not the thing there, right? The classical approximation of the wave function is the Hamilton function. The Hamilton reaction as a function of the initial final points in this case. Nobody would think that the Hamilton function is the actual thing out there, right? If I do the classical mechanics of this, is that I, I, I have the Hamilton function all over, but it doesn't mean that there is something actual all over. We're talking about realism. The Hamilton function is a way 
I have for predicting where I'm going to see this that is not in actual stuff. So the wave function, if you want to know the meaning of some quantity in a theory, just look at the approximation of the theory where you understand it, and you get it. So the approximation of the theory where we understand it is a classical approximation, and here we understand it. There's nothing ontological in the wave function. If this is right, um, we have to develop this way of thinking. We have to go back to the QM. Quantum mechanics is about this. It's about the particle being in a point of some time in some sense. And uh, relational quantum mechanics is the idea, first of all, that quantum theory, quantum mechanics is about units. Okay? Um, I sometimes call it events or quantum events. These are, if you want, are the outcome of measurement, but I don't want to talk about measurement because I don't want to bring human there. It's nothing to do with humans. Quantum events happen all over the universe where there are no humans, no measurement, no laboratory, no Anton Seidinger writing something in his notebook. Okay. So this is the quantum event, and this is the um, first one. Now, second point. Um, when these are discrete, right? Outcome measurement are discrete. They happen at some time. That's it. Abstract of Heisenberg 25 paper. We understand better the phenomena if we give up the idea that we have to be the continuous description of the part of the position of the particle. We have to position of the particle outside these three times. The ontology is more sparse than the classical one, not more heavy than the classical one. No more things, less things. Should we accept this as an axiom? Should we accept this uh, discreteness as an axiom, begin from that? How, how we are sure that it's We're not sure about anything here. We're <laughs> 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 we are trying to make sense of the theory, and I, I, my claim is here, let's try to make sense of the theory by first believing that these are the things we're talking about, and these are the things that describe the world. Okay? The outcome of measurements. These are the things that, uh, then I, I want to understand <coughs> when, when do, okay, follow me. We can take uh, continuous in any values. I mean, uh, separate operators can have continuous spectrum. They, in some cases, they may be continuous, but what I'm not sure. Uh, well, uh, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not taking the value. That... And free motion is a purely continuous spectrum with a plus of values. Um, sure. Uh, what I'm saying is that if you have a single particle, the position at each time doesn't need necessarily to be uh, the thing to which you give uh, meaning. Um, there is a beautiful uh, account of Heisenberg intuition in, the, in Copenhagen, I don't know if you remember the, in, in the play, in which he says, well, I was in the, in, in the park in, in Copenhagen near, behind what is today called the Warren Institute, Think about these things, and I saw a man walking. And uh, it was dark. It was very distant. Uh, the park was very dark, a few months. So I actually saw the man appearing under a lamp, and then nothing. And then appearing another lamp, then nothing. Uh, and then said Heisenberg, the place, uh, I thought, well, of course, this is a man, it's heavy and, and, and big, so I know where he is in between. And then there's a flash occurred to me. That's true for a man, but what about an electron? Do I really know? If I see it here, I see it there, I see it there, do I really know that in between it is somewhere? Maybe it doesn't mean anything. Maybe the electron is this manifestation, this manifestation, this manifestation, and there's nothing else at the story. And that's the intuition at the beginning of quantum theory. My opinion, quantum theory comes out from this situation. Now, um, in the old master's story, these things are manifested when I, the experimental look, um, when do the QM, uh, when are the QM become real, actualized? Let's make it 
simple. What happens when an experimental uh, major particle is interacting with it? Let's take away the, uh, the heavy load of an experimental being human, being big, being whatever, when there is an interaction. When interaction. <clears throat> so let's say a system one, system two, when there is some sort of interaction, they heat something exchange, some physical interaction, maybe the evolution of this and the evolution of this are not independent, when one affects the other one, there is a discrete interaction. What variables QN are actualized? Well, um, the way to the system 2 is affected by 1, it depends on some variable of 1. This is the one which is being actualized. Okay? If a screen is hit by a particle, the way the screen is hit by a particle depends on, the, on, on where the particle is. So the position of the particle is what it becomes actualized in the, in the interaction. Um, the key point here, difference from the standard interpretation, is that I'm not requiring to, to be neither undesired to make a measurement, nor a physicist, nor a PhD, nor a human being, nor consciousness like Wigner wants, nor an abstract uh, um, holder, sort of German subject uh, holder of information, or like Fuchs wanted, you know, the, 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 the perspective on the, on, on, on the world. That's all fine. But I want to say, whatever is true, um, an interaction between two and one actualizes the value of one, and vice versa, of course, um, which uh, determines how one system affects the other one. Um, so, uh, no required uh, um, uh, record, no uh, classicality, uh, complexity, uh, consciousness, or anything like that. We want to do physics. The only ingredients we have the systems and interactions. And here comes the key point. This can be done, this is coherent, at a cost. And this is the main point, and I explain the main point, and then we make a small break, and then after that, I will talk about everything that goes with it, information and all, 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 all the rest. So the main point, and I'll use this graph here, is that if I stop here, you would say, wait a moment, this doesn't work. This doesn't work because of <coughs> two atoms interact with one another and then collapse the function. Okay? Right. So here is a full story. Let me articulate the objection uh, cleanly. Suppose that one system one and system two, there's an interaction. And in, in the interaction, a certain variable Q of the system one is actualized and takes a certain value, say Q equal A. Okay? Now think of the Wigner friend situation. Like another system, three, which at a later time interacts with these two. Okay? And let me use a standard a textbook uh, language. Measures a quantity of the combined system, let's say E, <coughs> which happens not to commute with Q. According to standard quantum mechanics, okay, if three knew the earlier state of that, had interacted previously with this thing here, and want to compute the probability distribution of the possible value of P, three must disregard the fact that Q equals A, because in, 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 in many world uh, interpretation, quantum mechanic predicts interference between the branch Q equal A and the branch Q equal B. Right? So, how do you bring this together? Simply by saying that what happens in interaction is that Q taking the value of A 
with respect to two and not with respect to three. That's the ratio for two times. I've said it all. I'll just open up and explain what, what it means. So the story is the following. Think for a moment that the universe has many different systems, just as for the sake of adding that because of what we do in physics. With respect to one system, the rest of the world appears correctly as is described in quantum mechanics. At any interaction, any interaction counts as a measurement, okay? The value that the rest of this, the value of the rest of the system take uh, are described by the eigenvalues, the probability distribution are described by transition onto quantum mechanics. With respect to another system also, with respect to another system also, I believe that quantum mechanics is correct with me. Why? Because all the experiments of Anton and everybody else has come out right for, for me. So I believe that quantum mechanics works for me. But I also believe it works for you. And I believe that he, if you make a quantum mechanics experiment of me, I turn out to be a quantum mechanical object. So I just want to take this as a fact that all stay together. Which forces me to face the fact that value of quantity are actualized at some times, because otherwise we wouldn't have measurement outcomes, and we do. But also, when I compute transition amplitudes, I have to disregard interactions um, when, uh, when I'm dealing with a composite system. So in other words, let me make it slightly more uh, technical. Uh, this story here has a description with respect to two and a description with respect to three. A description with respect to two is that at some time t, um, the variable q takes a value a, so the system one has a stage a. But with respect to three, um, what happens at time t is that the common system of these two um, might evolve into a combined state, A for one tensor, some correlated thing for, for one, plus B uh, for one tensor, some correlated thing B for two. So I want to say that this intuition is correct and this description is also correct. This description is correct with respect to two, this description is correct with respect to three. Q equal A is true with respect to two, is not true with respect to three in the sense, three is not measuring anything, in the sense that later on when it measures something, three should not use the fact that Q equal A because there are both branches still needed to compute a probability amplitude. When they want to measure the distribution of probability for P, uh, the, the, he has to compute uh, some C some eigenvalue of P, so we call C psi, modulo square, and then there is the interference between this term and this term. So, the moral of the story is, uh, let's take quantum mechanics at face value with respect to any system counter the system. Okay? That's the ratio of quantum mechanics. Um, there is a lot to say um, in uh, about that. There is a clear advantage, there is a clear cost. So let me just make a list of advantages and a list of costs, and then we make a break, and then as I said, I'll discuss uh, the relation of that with information, which is nice, because now you can look at the information for the respect of two or for the respect of three and see what, what is the dictionary. And I'll talk about the reconstruction and a few other things. But let me just <coughs> Um, close this hour with a list of uh, advantages and then costs, so plus and minuses. The plus are clear, in my opinion. There is no many world, just one world, where things happen. Okay? We don't have to assume that there are all sorts of worlds. Um, there is nothing hidden and there is nothing that breaks Lorentz invariance, there is nothing that smells physical. There is no physical process that we're assuming that we haven't seen yet, there's nothing of the sort. 
which is going to attract this thing. Okay? It's coherent, it's consistent. It is consistent. There's 20 years that this thing is on the table, have been looked by everybody. At the beginning, people will say, oh, it's not consistent. It is consistent. So the plus is known of the other difficulties. <coughs> well, so why does, don't anybody jump on that? Say, oh, yeah, that's a clear solution of the, Because it's a cost. Okay. So the minus, the cost, what is the cost? Well, the cost is that any statement that we give about the wall has to be labeled by an observer. So it is not true. We cannot give a description of the world in terms of unlabeled fact. This is here univocally as a description of the universe. This is there univocally description of the universe. And make a list of all of this. Because all, if, if I see this here, maybe you can ma have ma measurement in the past and measure in the future such that in your calculation, it turns out that I'm in a superposition of this here, and me believing is here, and this there, and me believing is there. So every statement about the world has to be related. That's why it's, it's called measure of mechanics, to a system with respect to which it is true. Which system? The system that interacting um, with, with the chalk uh, has got the information that the chalk is here or the chalk is there. So it is a realist interpretation that is a weakened realism because unless you fix the perspective, the point of view, you have to live with this uh, um, relational aspect of variables. In physics, we have a lot of relational variables, like velocity. Velocity is not a property of an object, it's a property, relative property of two objects. But it's a big jump to say that all the variables, all the contingent property of objects, are relational. So I'll give you the main idea. I suggest we take a five, ten minutes break to breathe, so you can start digest that, and then uh, reconvene, and uh, I will ask you to talk about information. I will translate that in the language of information. <laughs> Okay, the second part will be shorter and then uh, we'll have a reasonable break and then there's a question session. Uh, so, uh, some of you came and said, but this is the same as standard quantum mechanics. It, it, it is very similar to standard quantum mechanics. This is standard quantum mechanics. Uh, but uh, the way I think about it, it's taking seriously quantum mechanics and, and the consequence of quantum mechanics when we include the fact that the measure of the apparatus can always uh, be viewed as quantum systems. So the difference between quantum mechanics in the way it is usually um, described uh, in, in, in the textbook is that, and this, this is also the difference with um, cubitism, books, and company, um, is that uh, instead of assuming an observer that looks at the world, make measurement, <coughs> and sort of collapses the function, gets values, actualizes physical variables every time it interacts with the world. Instead of that, uh, I think there are many, we can view the world as many systems, many subsystems, interacting with one another at different times. And uh, quantum mechanics is true with respect to each one of them meaning the actualization of the variable of this system with respect to this system happen when there is an interaction here, but does not happen with respect to this system or this system or this system. So in, 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 in the language of standard uh, quantum mechanics, uh, when you make a measurement, 
it is true that there is a fact that the spin is up, if I've seen it up, so I've collapsed the wave function to spin up. With respect to me, now everything I measure in the future is determined by the fact that spin was up. So I can collapse the wave function to do the next calculation. But with respect to anybody making a measurement, including me, it is still true that nothing has collapsed. So in the calculations, the wave function I have to take into account of both branches, spin up me seeing spin up, plus spin down me seeing spin down. Because the interference between the two, um, it's real, it's predicted by quantum mechanics. If it's a short question, yes, otherwise it's the long we go. Between? 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 Well, just psi. And there's never assumed a, um, an actualization of variables. I'm saying that with respect to every system, there's an actualization of variables. The ontology of many words is psi. The ontology of relational quantum mechanics is a relation of psi. Is. So it's the opposite ontology. I'm saying that what confuses us is giving value to psi, giving even ontological weight to psi. The, the theory is not about psi, it's about variable having value. This being here now, the electric field being pointing that direction, this being black and this being white. That's what the theory is about. But these quantities are all like velocity, relational. So this is white respect to me, this is black respect to me, and so on. Okay, this is here with respect to me and respect to you. Good. So, <clears throat> um, first of all, is there, is this a solid system? Uh, what is a relation? between perspectives. Perspective meaning, what is the relation between the variable q being equal to a, say, with respect to 3, or q equal to a with respect to 2? How is the world seen by me and the world seen by you? Hopefully not. Am I saying that every physical system has a perspective about the rest of the world and they don't talk about it? Why? Because uh, um, physical system interact. Let me put it very uh, <coughs> simply. Suppose you measure uh, the speed of a system and, and measure spin up. Now, I, as a physical system, I'm sort of anthropologizing everything. I can measure spin up, but I can also ask you what have you measured. So nothing prevents you and me to communicate. And I said, what have you measured? So in, uh, I've just erased the, the, from my perspective, from my perspective, um, the combined state of you after the measurement is uh, spin up times uh, one, times you having seen spin up plus spin down times you having seen spin down. So if I ask you what have, what have you measured, I'm measuring this variable here. So from my perspective, if I ask you what have you measured, I measure this operator here, and I can get either this answer or this answer. And from my perspective, I then projected the the state either here or here. So if after having asked you what have you measured, I measure the spin, I get the same result. So quantum mechanics is nicely clear, this is the solar structure of quantum mechanics, that nicely work to make the different perspective clear. Of course, if I measure a quantity that does not commute with what you measured, then this doesn't work anymore. And there is an incoherence. But that's the 
but you can size it a little. That's the fact that the electrode is going to exist anymore, whatever you want to read into it. So in other words, systems can communicate with one another, they won't look the same to all systems, up to the quantum mechanical uncertainty information. Not exactly, up to a part. Okay. Now, information. I know that Anton is uh, very keen of thinking about quantum mechanics uh, in terms of information, and there is, a, <coughs> there is a, a lot of people who think about quantum mechanics in terms of information, the QB people, and so on. Um, it all started with uh, Joe Wheeler, uh, who is the first one who said, uh, uh, look at information if you want to understand about quantum mechanics. John had, a, John is, had also fantastic ideas in physics. And uh, it was vague about that. It was nothing, nothing, no, nothing precise. Uh, but wrote this um, famous text, uh, it from bit, um, in which he was uh, trying to reduce entire physics to, um, to information. I was strongly influenced by John uh, Wheeler, not not only quantum gravity, uh, but also thinking about quantum mechanics. In fact, the the, my, my, my 96 paper, it, uh, it has a long second part about information and has postulated quantum mechanics in terms of inflation, and it came a lot from, from John Wheeler. And then my paper was picked up by, by Fuchs and it was picked up by other people. Uh, as, as far as I believe, uh, Britain is uh, designer and, and myself did not know about one another. And uh, we came out with the same two main postulates. I think they're the same. Are they more or less? Uh, more for, for a physicist like me, let's say, for a precise person <laughs> um, like you, you know. um, I'll, I'll, I'll say what the cost of uh, the cost of part. I, I think that Anton, I don't know, was also under the influence of John, John Wheeler, uh, or at least got something. That was in, in the air, I think, mean, from, uh, from, from some time. So, what do we mean by information? Um, the, the, the notion of information is tricky because information means all sorts of things. <clears throat> and uh, it's very slippery because uh, it's used... Uh, 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 I mean, you have a USB key. How much information is, is, is there? Well, there is one giga. Uh, although it's nothing, it's just those rounds. It's both correct, but we use information in a different, in a different sense. There is a common use of information which is mental, is knowledge. So it requires a subject, it requires to know what is knowledge, what is, uh, uh, so that's sort of high level meanings of information. There are most, more, more physical meanings of the information. Um, there is, in fact, one version, maybe, maybe we should have different names because this is a source of confusion, but there is one very simple version of the notion of information, which is relative information, which comes from Shannon, and it's not the, the first definition of information that Shannon gives, but it's uh, in his text, uh, page uh, 12, or whatever. And uh, it's just convention. So physical information, there is a notion of physical, a physical notion of information, physical information, Let me try to define it clearly. If you have uh, two systems, um, this system and this system, and both of them can be in some number of states. Right? So this is a physical system that can be in a number of states. Suppose that this is a, in some hole that can be like that or like that. So there's two possible positions. Okay? And this also, suppose it can be like that. Too. So there's two possible positions. So together, there can be in four possible positions. Right? One, two, three, four. Now, you see the information, if there's something physical tying the two, okay, with a piece of iron, such that they can be only like either like that or like that. Okay? Take uh, the imaginary. One hand can be north or south. The other hand can also be north or south. 
but they cannot do both at the same time. It's a physical thing, it's the battle which is, that imposes this is north, this is south. Okay? If there is this connection, this physical connection between these two, okay? so between this and this, we say that that's channel, and there is relative information between the two. And technically, um, you take the number of state of this two, the number of state of this two, you multiply two by two is four. If the number of state of the combined system is less than four, is two, then there is relative equation. So measure is uh, the number of state of this times the number of state of this divided by the number of states of both of them. You get one is <coughs> information is um, more than one you get that information. More precisely, first is log of that. Because you like log when you talk about information. So physical information is just uh, is, 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 is just that between two systems. So you have two systems, and uh, you have n states here, n state here, uh, and uh, so let's say n one and two states, and the combine has n state. And this is log of n one times n two divided by n. Okay. There's nothing mental, nothing. I know nothing uh, extra physical in this particular notion. <clears throat> it's just correlation. Now, look what happens in relational quantum mechanics. Information comes out sort of twice, and in a clean way. Because let's go back to this prototypical situation in which I have system one and a system two, which interacts, and uh, uh, some quantity is measured, and uh, um, Q is equal to A. I can say, Alasanger, Alasanger, that two, two has information about one, and the information is that Q is equal to A. In a sort of intuitive notion of information. Okay? So, uh, as a result of a measurement, a quantity has taken a certain value, and how to know that the quantity of this value, the, the outcome gives us information about the state of one. This is information, this is what um, quantum theory is about. The information that you have about one. In, in this uh, intuitive sense, quantum theory is about information that <coughs> two has about But let's look at this from the perspective of a, a, a third system. And suppose that the third system knew the initial state of this combine, which was a tensor state. What happens when there is interaction? Well, we know that the standard analysis of measurement that you do in uh, quantum mechanics measurement, what happens is that an initial tensor state may evolve in a correlated state, the one I've written over and over again, this state here. Okay? What does this state is telling me? It's telling me that these three measures um, up here, um, it and then measure, uh, say, the quantum variable, the 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 the, uh, the state, the corresponding state of two. Um, if if he sees this, he sees this, he sees this, he sees this. So in other words, uh, when three makes a measurement, the possible state of the spin in one is up and down. The possible state of say the pointer variable is up and down. 2 times 2 is 4, but of this 4, only 2 are realized. So, there is a correlation between 1 and 2 in the sense of Shannon, in the strictly physical sense of Shannon. So, from the perspective of 3, um, the effect of the interaction is, to say, is, to, is that 2 has information About one in the sense of channel 
Careful, there's a slight difference between these two statements, right? This is a physical statement about the existence of a correlation. It's a physical property of the couple system. The couple system is such after the, after the measurement that it becomes correlated. But the fact it becomes correlated translates easily into what we say that two has information about one. And represents what we do in the laboratory when we take a measurement and we get information. <coughs> the, the, the slight difference is that in, in, in one case, uh, there, there's a difference between knowing that two knows the spin of one and knowing what <coughs> is the spin of one the two knows. If I know that the, if three can compute that the spin is, is, is this one, three knows that two knows the spin of one, but doesn't know which one. Okay? So why this discussion? Because I think that information is a very useful concept um, for thinking about quantum mechanics, but uh, it's, I, I don't think that um, I think that the world is a world. It has properties. It has uh, um, quantities, variables, that take values. And uh, the key uh, message of quantum mechanics uh, is uh, all this uh, taking values is relative to systems. Now we can express this in saying system have information about variables, but we shouldn't get confused from the fact that then information comes with all sorts of uh, uh, heavy mental, psychological, recording uh, properties, which have nothing to do with physics. Okay? So, um, yes, we can rephrase everything in terms of information theory, but um, I have a certain difficulty of saying, well, let's only put information on the basis of everything, <clears throat> because if I start from that, I don't know what information is. I do know what information is if I take channel definition, but then the information is, is defined in terms of system having values. So before information, I have the variables and, 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 and the possible Value that they can take. So the foundation is variables having possible values, not information by itself. Um, uh, given that, and given that, um, um, uh, nevertheless. Um, I, I do think that uh, information is uh, it, it's a good uh, um, it's a good way for describing the general structure of quantum mechanics telling us about the world. Um, Mauro Dorato has clarified that in my opinion. Um, you probably know Einstein's difference between the constructed theories and theories in principle principle theory. Um, especially if it is a principle theory, um, and the mind is a constructive theory. So you, 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 you can give physical theory by giving the dynamics, and, or uh, you can write down some general principles and then have something you think you know about, about nature. I say consider the principle theory as a very approximate description of the world and a constructive theory, the good one here to go to. Especially that it is not a constructive theory. It's a general idea about how the world should be, but that has to be implemented in a concrete theory. Now, when you do a constructive theory, you have to list down your, your variables 
and the benign mutations. And to manage this, you say, well, there is an electromagnetic field that satisfies this equation, they act, attract on charges, no export, and so on. When you do a principal theory, <coughs> you don't have to start from the basis. You can start from the end. Okay? The velocity, the, the velocity of light is the same in all references. What is light? What is references? You don't, have, you don't need to say it. Okay? The same, <coughs> so in a principal theory, you can use notions which are not fundamental, which are high level notions. So I think you can formulate quantum mechanics as a principal theory in terms of information, meaning that then you have to fill it up with the actual quantum theory in which you say what are your variables, what you're talking about. Okay? Given these caveats, information theory is wonderful to talk about quantum mechanics. And uh, I want to, um, in, in my 96 paper, I, I uh, wrote two postulates, in fact, three postulates totally in terms of information theory, and said, I believe that from that one can reconstruct the, the Hilbert space language of quantum mechanics entirely. The creator of the one. And I attempted a reconstruction using quantum logic uh, sort of technology, uh, sort of failing. And uh, then there have been, um, uh, a number of attempts in the years. And I think that the, the, the last version, which is due to Philip Hohn, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's pretty good because uh, it has a list of uh, very simple postulates written in terms of information theory, out of which, at least for a system with a finite number of degrees of freedom, you can reconstruct the other space formalism. Um, I, I don't want to go through that. It's a lot of technology. It's a very technological, mathematical uh, part. But I want to tell you what are the two main postulates that I wrote down. Because independently, Zeilinger, in his papers of the what is 97, 90, same time, independently, came out with the same two postulates with Buchner. Bu uh, but whatever. Uh, I, I, uh, and the two postulates are the following. <coughs> um, and in some non-technical sense, I do think that this captures the, the core of quantum mechanics. Um, you, you, you have to add some specifications, but the core is here. And they're written in terms of information theory, and uh, the way I write it is for a system with a finite number of, uh, a finite system, say, finite number of computers or something like that. So the first postulate is that uh, uh, the relevant information about the system is uh, 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 about the system, say one, is fine. Now I want to say what is relevant information and what exactly do I mean by relevant information here. By relevant information, I mean the following. <coughs> Suppose I measure the spin of a spin one half particle, okay? I measure spin half in the z direction. Then I can predict the probability distribution of the spin in any other direction. Right? Now suppose I measure again spin up in the I don't gain anything. I have the same information as before. So having measured twice, uh, spin up doesn't doesn't uh, add information. So the, the previous one is is, is not valid. Of course, if a system um, with a higher number of degrees of freedom to get to the maximum number of uh, the maximum information, I have to measure many things. Okay? For an atom, I have to measure the energy, the hydrogen atom uh, state, and the angular momentum, the z component of the angular momentum, then I'm done. So, by relative information, I mean the list of the previous measurements. Okay, all the previous measurements, restricted to the one which are not irrelevant for the in the future. Okay? And the claim is that there is a finite amount of information that I can get. Now, that seems pretty stupid because every finite system has a finite amount of information. That's, the point is that when you put it together with the second postulate, 
which is, I can always get new relevant information. Now it seems in contradiction, but it's obviously not in contradiction because of the relevant. If you, if I measure spin out in the z direction, and then I make a measurement of the spin in another direction, or some angle, or in the x direction, okay, I gain new information. Suppose I measure the spin in the x direction, because now I know for sure, for instance, that if I measure the spin in the x direction, once again, okay. But in doing so, so I gain new information, but in doing so, the previous information becomes, becomes irrelevant. I erase the effect of the previous information in my ability to predict in the future. Okay? And that's cannot, that's never true for a classical system. In a classical system, I can either learn more about the system, more and more and more and more, if I get a maximum, that's it. I cannot get the information. I cannot make it irrelevant previous information. Now it turns out that um, um, from that um, plus a number of details, ask Philip, <laughs> um, you can get Hilbert spaces, self adjoint operators, um, eigenvalues, uh, uh, Bohr rules, and uh, 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 and else. So in this sense, what, what was the effort here? The effort is, uh, we, we learn quantum mechanics, so quantum mechanics is not wave function of Schrodinger equation. We learn quantum mechanics from textbooks with this heavy formalism, Hilbert space, eigenvalues, transition amplitudes. Uh, can we translate that in a number of simple statements about the world, the way Einstein uh, Derive the Lorentz transformation from just uh, speed of light and uh, and, uh, and and relativity of, of, of velocity. Can we do something similar? Um, to a good extent, um, all this complicated machinery can be translated in, in a few simple properties that the information we can gather about system have. This two being the main uh, uh, the main ones. I don't have much more time. I have um, all sorts of things I wanted to say, but let me just uh, um, go fast about uh, about them. Um, I guess I want to say something about realism because uh, uh, and this I've said already, um, and something about uh, at a specific point. Um, about uh, um, time reversal, which is something related to what. So one uh, one general consideration <clears throat> and one uh, one technical con uh, consideration. Then I stop. <clears throat> so So one of the <clears throat> first, um, one of the main objections against uh, um, uh, the relation is that it's non-realist. I don't think it's non-realist, or at least <clears throat> realism, and this is a serious reflection of the realism. Realism is a very vague word, okay? Uh, depending what you mean by realism. <clears throat> so you can be a non-realist by thinking that it's all in the mind, and there's nothing outside it. That's one way to be non-realist about it. <coughs> Definitely, relational quantum mechanics is not non-realist in that sense. Very realistic. Uh, here there is a world there, <coughs> a system, they interact, uh, properties are true. 
a relation, but they're true or false. Um, uh, so, in this weak sense, um, it's strong myths, but the relation quantum mechanics. Much more than cubitism or uh, sort of single perspective view of quantum mechanics. There's no subject with respect to which quantum mechanics exists. So, uh, so, in this sense, uh, relation quantum mechanics is realistic. In fact, uh, I mentioned naturalism. What do I mean by naturalism here? By naturalism, I, I mean the idea that everything that has to do with us knowing the world, knowledge, and with us in particular, um, we expect to be able to understand in terms of uh, um, natural sciences and in terms of the way we describe the rest of the world. So it's the idea that we are part of nature and we're not outside nature. Okay? So it doesn't mean that we know how to construct the brain and, and we know how consciousness works, but it means that we want a theory where we think it's possible, in principle, that we are just one of the many things in nature. Okay? If you do that, in a sense, this is the philosophical underpinning of relational quantum mechanics. You want the subject that has information to be one of the many possible systems around. Okay? That's, that's all. So, it's, uh, relational quantum mechanics is strongly natural in that sense. In a sense, more than, um, <clears throat> more than most other, uh, many, the many other uh, alternatives. However, um, uh, the realism uh, of relational quantum mechanics <coughs> is weakened, is weakened by uh, by relations. If by realism you uh, you mean that uh, you expect that it's possible to describe the world at every moment, moment of time by giving an objective value of a number of variables describing the world which are objectively fixed um, and true at every time, then in this sense the theory is not realistic. Okay? Why is it not realistic? Because the values of variables are only relational. And be careful, because even the fact that Q2 is equal to A with respect to 2, this is a relational statement as well. So you can only talk about um, a combination of perspectives, one from each point to a few. You cannot talk about the world from outside. You cannot make a map of the world like this. And that's what makes relational quantum mechanics I would say not universally accepted. Not everybody jumps up and says, oh yeah, that's Because there is this, uh, uh, the sense of unease by not having a map of the, a full map of the world written down, written down there, which you do have in, uh, in, in Bohemian mechanics, you do have in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in many world uh, interpretation, you do have a collapse of picture. I mean, a wave function, the wave function evolves, and you expect somehow you have other problems, you have other difficulties, but you, you have a strong realism, right? you say that's what it is. It's a wave function of the space of computation of fields on the net. Here, you avoid all the other problems, but you have to deal with this uh, relationality. Now, relationality is its core in, uh, in physics since Galileo. Okay? Velocity is not a property of two objects. Velocity is a pro pro property of two objects. One with respect to the other. My velocity is zero with respect to the Earth, it's 11 kilometers per second with respect to the Sun, and so on. So there's nothing wrong in relational properties. But even velocity was hard to digest. I mean, if you read Newton, even Newton had difficulty of truly digesting. In fact, the way you compute a Newton is not the absolute perfect definition of velocity. And then the theorem that says you cannot measure it. Somehow there's a preferred direction. Um, 
So it seems to me that the relational aspect are, are core in modern physics, and that's what quantum mechanics is telling us. One of the reasons I like relational quantum mechanics works well in quantum gravity, but I'm not going to that works better, in my opinion, than other. other. Um, I wanted to talk about time and reverse environment, but I think we are tired, and it's minus time, so we'll pick up other questions on, on tomorrow, the discussion tomorrow. Um, there are many other things, there are other papers uh, written on this subject, but I just wanted to give you the basis, so I'll stop here. for not being able to attend your, to take your lecture. Knowing you and your work, I'm confident that you have delivered an excellent talk and that both the students say you have a great time. <laughs> so my question referred to the notion of an interaction, which I anticipate you have mentioned when introducing your relational quantum mechanics. I know that you have been hesitant to talk about observer or agent, and, and you put them on the same level as any other physical system. I understand that this is one of the reasons that you refer to interactions as a fundamental ingredient for relational viewpoints of quantum states. It seems to me, however, that the notion of interactions alone is insufficient for a relational viewpoint. Let me explain this with an example. A photon impinging on a beam splitter interacts with it, but does not get entangled with it. Two colliding particles may interact and get entangled. Only the second type of interaction leads to relational quantum states of one particle with respect to another. Do you, think that, do you think that for this reason the notion of interaction in relation with quantum mechanics needs a refinement? And if so, what this refinement could be? Uh, yeah, I think it's right. So, um, I think it's right. So, in order. Uh, yes, I think it's right. So, uh, there is a. Actualization of a quantity, measurement, where there is an interaction, but not always when there is an interaction, there is an actualization of quantity. And uh, when it's there, well, when there is a tangle, that's exactly the, the, the that's point. I mean, the, 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 the claim here is that you can always just, you have a double description of each interaction. You have a description sort of from the inside and from the other side. Um, from the inside is to treat one quantum system as quantum with every class. So there is an interaction, you don't measure anything. Uh, you keep the thing and then it comes back. Um, to have an interaction, you, you, you need your classical system to be affected by the quantum system by some body. And uh, uh, Well, you don't need a, you don't need a, you don't need an entanglement. You need something weaker than entanglement. You just only need that uh, the evolution of two changes according to to the state of one. Because a measurement, a, a non non demolition how it has for measurement is still a measurement. If, you, if the system, if the spin is up, and you send it to a sender and, and, and you measure it being up, this is not measuring, and this is not So, um, so, I, so I backtrack to, to the statement from the statement that you need an entanglement state. You need a, you need a correlation. And the correlation is uh, uh, is uh, can be there. Yeah, you need a correlation, which is there even if it's a single one. Up and up is a correlated uh, state. Even if it's not up and up plus um, right. So you need you need a correlation. You need information in the sense that you can Thank you. It's a good question I had me to think about. I think that's the right answer. I have, I have a statement with a question. Yeah? The statement is, I, 
do not really think that there are two principles which are in correspondence to the original Zeilinger's principle. Because in this part, uh, this is a foundation of physics in the late, uh, late 90s or so, where, where he kind of rediscovered entanglement. He, he said, you can have, it's just what, what Schrodinger said, you can have individuality or you can have relational properties of those states. So, so this is, I, I think this is very, this is somehow different from two. You may say, well, you can always, if you measure something, then you gain something, but out of nothing, out of nowhere. You know? But this is, this is, I don't think that this is the main thrust of science really. And the second, and secondly, I have a question. I mean, you were mentioning this nesting argument, which is ultimately not, I think, it's due to weakness, but to, to, I mean, it, it is really Everett who, who put it on the second page. Everett? Everett. Everett had this nesting argument. Right. Yeah. But Everett is much after Beaver. Just after Beaver, not before Beaver. Well, there, there is some discussion in the book by Bailey on that. By? By Bailey. Bailey has a biography of. of, of okay, Everett. well, yeah. Anyway. So, but, but you, you were mentioning this nesting argument. The nesting argument is really all about the unitary state transformations. It's a kind of, you are entering in quantum mechanics, you are entering the unitary track. Because your unitary transformations are always permutations. And you cannot have uh, from one to one transformations uh, in, uh, in, in many to one transformations. This is just disallowed in group theory. So, so you get the measurement problem. So you get the entire issue with uh, this coherence and so on and so forth, with which way was, was on. I'm not sure if you get rid of the, of the coherence issue in your interpretation. Because, uh, I mean, if, 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 you, if you think of it nested all the time, you have to go to bigger and bigger systems and everything gets in what, what Schrodinger calls uh, in a kind of quantum quagmire. He, he calls this gentrification. Because, uh, because the, the observers get more and more involved with each other, and, and at the end you end up with the same problems that they have. I mean, well, how, how do you think you can avoid that? Good. So, with respect to the first question, um, we both said somehow. So, what do you mean by somehow? Uh, there is a lot of similarity between uh, the, the postulates in, in my 96 paper and uh, one version of the postulate that uh, uh, Anton wrote a um, couple of years later. They're not exactly the same. Uh, Anton says they're very similar. I mean, I, it's a, I, I don't want to claim that they are the same thing, so it doesn't matter. I just wanted to notice that they're both, uh, in terms of information theory, one it's about the limitation of information theory and the other is about uh, the possibility of having Perhaps we'll refer to different papers by Anton. You can ask him and have his point too. It's not particularly, I just didn't want to claim for myself something that was independent if I want to buy it. Because here, I mean, the second postulate is that Zeilinger derives a kind of entanglement. 
These two postulates are sufficient to derive quantum mechanics as they are. I didn't claim that. It was uh, just mentioning that there are some similarities and there are some differences. So we agree that there are some differences and maybe we disagree that there are similarities. I'm happy. I don't see the difference. I just wanted to remark that there is a, we both started to think in terms of information independently at some point and try to argue. Something. Now the second question, the first was a statement. The second question um, there is no unitarity here at all. The unitarity is broken at each interaction. Okay? The theory is not about a unitary evolving state at all. The theory is about um, observed values at some time and the probability amplitudes of observed value at some other time. After which you forget unit evolution, you have the new observed values and uh, you have a, a new probability distribution of the next one only in terms of this. Okay. So this is what the theory is about. Light in standard yeah, yeah, class. So how, how, how do you accommodate then with the, with the uniform unitary evolution which is postulated in standard me the quantum mechanics? Yeah. Do, you, in, do you believe that this is in, in standard quantum mechanics, as I read in textbooks, so in my textbooks, which were uh, Landau, Dirac, Messiaen, Wendell, Jean, Berkeley, and Feynman, in, in, this, in this five textbook, uh, including Dirac, in which I studied. Uh, Dirac says, don't bother. Can I finish my sentence? Don't bother. Can I say what yeah. you want? So, in these textbooks, in none of these textbooks was ever written that the state evolves unitary forever. And in, in none of these textbooks. In other textbooks, I read that, for instance, in Simon Sanders, okay, or in uh, Max Tegmark, some cosmologist. But it, in, 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 in the textbooks I wrote, the unit of evolution is only between a measurement and another measurement, not after that measurement, right? And what I'm saying is that I believe the confusion is uh, willing to extrapolate the unit of evolution beyond where it belongs according to standard textbook quantum mechanics. It, it, it doesn't. What is unitary is only the probability, the probability distribution uh, from one measurement to the next one. Uh, that's what Dirac put it. Dirac has a bracket notation is exactly that. It's probability of going from a, from a from a from a from, from, from a set of uh, not beyond that. Uh, the difficulty of that is uh, well, but when when is this broken? When there's an observer, who is the observer, and uh, who is the, what breaks that? Um, what I want to claim is that the breaking of the unit of evolution, it's true, but it's uh, dependent on the system interaction. So there's no contradiction between this unit evolution being broken, say, at time t0, t1, between 1 and 2 interact, and continuing just all the way at the time t3, with respect to the system 3, um, which is not interacting with the two systems between the two. So I, I, I'm sorry to say, I agree with what you say, but I, I'm here there's no, no Continuity of the unit evolution beyond the interaction. Um, 
<coughs> yeah, thanks very much for your talk. I think I think I believe pretty much everything that you said, apart from maybe that one one minor, perhaps but, major point, but, but, but one point. You know, maybe maybe it's you know, maybe maybe you know what Ed Star would say, everything before the last is good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe we can just be pleased about it, or, uh, or maybe I convince you that, that this relation of thought is actually perhaps even less realist than, than you want it to be. So do I understand it correctly that the ontology of this relational approach lies in these fundamentals? Um, but then, so for, from a conceptual point of view, here's, here's the rough argument why, why that seems weird or strange. Because if the interaction is constitutive of what the world is like, then what is it that interacts? Right? You, you, don't have any, you don't have any ontology there that can do the interacting if there is, you know, if, if, if the world only is, has a determined state, or at least determined to be one way rather than another, after the interaction. So it seems weird to say, well, the ontology is the kind of those interactions. I mean, this is a very sort of broad conceptual cousin that I may have. And I think, actually, you, you may as well just look to drop this, but then it becomes, um, to, to drop this idea of quantum events as constituting the ontology. Then the relation from the is a lot less realist than when you see it in reality. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't have an answer. I, you, have, you, have, you have a point here. Um, and, uh, and that's a discussion about the realism of, uh, of, of the, the theory. Uh, look, the, the philosophers that have looked into that have given different take to the relation. Perhaps the one I like most is the last one, my brother and the doctor, who has a structural realism interpretation. There's, there's a lot, something very fashionable among philosophers nowadays, which is called structural realism, which is what is real, not entities, but relations. And she wants to interpret the relation by the mechanic in this way. Um, I don't want to enter into that because it's not my, my domain. But somehow, point B, the old currency of this. Um, the other philosophical meaning, Van Fassen, which is a major American philosopher, he's not a realist, he's an empiricist. So he's very happy with that, but for a fully empiricist perspective, not for a realist perspective. In fact, he was enormously happy with this. This is you, this is empiricist model versions, really similar. That's, yeah, yeah, and that's why he was so happy with some of those things. Look at them. Um, there's, a, there's a French philosopher which is Bit Bold, Michel Bit Bold. Who is a Kantian, a neo Kantian. So he means this is a Kantian, okay? So well, this is the, 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 the conditions of the way knowledge is. Uh, but it's all about. But he only writes in French. Huh? But he only writes in French, though. Which yes, not only in terms of language, but also in terms of complexity. For Germans, I don't know. I'll stop here. I don't, I don't want to do more. It's much better. I have to follow up with you in a second. Yeah. Um, I don't agree with you. Uh, I'm not sure you. I'm not really sure what you said. You said that basically you, you missed the regulata in this, right? It's the problem of, of like context structure really is that you only have relation relation between what? This oh. is your question. Mm -hmm. Why? So I don't think it works with structure really because on this approach you have two, you have two structural descriptions. Right. Yeah. And you don't have one common structure in the way that structure really is usually like to define what you want to Right? So what you, can uh, because you have one description by the internal observer and one description by the external, and both are relational, so they're both the structural descriptions of what's going on. So you actually have two structural descriptions. Well, you have many, not two, you have as many as. Yeah, you have at, least, at least two in those cases in which relational common mechanics takes part. Um, so I don't think this works with the kind of uh, find the symmetries, the commonalities of the different descriptions, and that's the structure we're going to Look, use. Look, instead of value assignment, you have value assignment labeled by subsystems. Yeah. Okay. So you have a sort of collection of value assignment labeled by subsystems. For each subsystem, you have you have a set of values. That's a collection. I, I, I know you can complain. Right. Yes. <laughs> you know, but then here comes my, my judgment. So, okay. uh, reading from your paper, I don't think is consistent with what you said. That you, you have actually entities, 
So from the system. Space, yeah, space is blue and, and, and burst by through it. Yes. You said um, and, and these birds in space are, can be constituted by molecules, particles, fields, or whatever you say. So you actually have entities in your ontology, oh, yeah. and, the, and the entities do not have properties before the reason interaction. So they, they acquire the, the value of the, yeah. of the properties are, are actually repeat, uh, coming to be through yeah. interaction, right? So yeah. is this your ontology? Ah, uh, thank you, because you, you, you picked me here. I shift to <laughs> uh, Yes, I definitely do. Um, so, right, so um, let me say what I'm shifting between. I'm shifting between, uh, I, I do have entities, okay? There's an electron, there is, a, yeah. there is, a, there is fields, depending on what the physics is, is, is taking. Let me be more precise. The ones which are relational are only the contingent properties. If you have a particle, the mass is not relational. Mass to mass. I mean, forget special cases. How do we know that these are not Okay? Uh, so the ones that vary, the phase space, where it is in phase space, everything which can vary, that's relational. Not the low no, no contingent, not the fixed uh, properties. So that's the simplest reading. You have entities, these entities are well defined. That uh, that ontology or the ones that physics is talking about, um, they have some properties which just characterize them. For instance, a particle is characterized by which questions you can ask to it, its dynamics, its mass, and so on. But then, what we usually call its state, that can change, the variable, that's only relation. So the the the, the way it is, uh, uh, how much is the electric field, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, um, that's only relational. Um, so, uh, you're right. I, I, from that, I often am tempted to shift to a more radical relational uh, perspective. I've been reading a little too recently. And, uh, but I, I'm not sure I want to be capable of thinking. Follow up on the bigger spread scenario, and if I understand correctly, say it's, it's a non issue in this framework. And I know some people think it's an issue, and there are arguments, for example, that the observer one can send a message or he writes something to the observer three, and then there's yeah. some contradiction. So I never understood the argument. I wonder if, if yeah, very good. So let me, give you, let me give you the answer to the argument. So, so it makes the argument clear. The answer to the argument is that all these arguments are based on the idea that it's something classic. Okay? The observer two can take a piece of paper, write it down, nail it to the other one, and boom, you get some contradiction. What the answer? A piece of paper is a quantum object. Being a quantum object can be in superpositions. If you keep this into account, then you're full into quantum mechanics and you I claim that most contradictions of quantum mechanics is forgetting that the world is quantum mechanical. EPR is a typical example. Right? Um, you split a particle, you make a measurement here, a measurement here, okay? then you have to look for correlation. How do you look for correlation? Well, you, send, you write on a piece of paper here, you write on a piece of paper here, you send it to a common guy who read the paper and check the correlation, forgetting that this piece of paper are quantum object. So they can be themselves in, in superpositions. So I think that if you, every time you find something apparently contradictory in quantum mechanics, is resolved by realizing that you're squeezing in some classical, something which is, cannot be used in position, something that is, a, it's a, or if you want from this language, something that has a value, a non-labeled value. Um, if I got it rightly, um, the problem of relational quantum mechanics is to take uh, these two postulates and build up what we call this principle theory and which um, predictions, which physical predictions, yeah, it is equivalent to ordinary quantum mechanics. This is right, and I would like to know um, at, which, at which stage this problem is and uh, if it then can be used as an alternative to 
reporters from the ICDC who don't have to go in with quantum mechanics, but that you could eventually go in with this quantum theory and um, I would say no. In my first paper, I, I really did two things. And uh, I presented it very connected, uh, but I don't think they're so connected. So one thing is, uh, can we make sense of quantum mechanics in a relation? A second thing is, uh, can we reconstruct quantum mechanics uh, from information postulates? I was hoping the second to support the first. It turned out to be more complicated for me than it would look like. I, I think the two are, may talk to one another, but it, it's not the same thing. So I would like to disentangle the two. I mean, relational quantum mechanics and technical quantum mechanics independently of whether you can reconstruct the full theory from information. Uh, now, second question of yours, where are we? I'll ask you. If, uh, I think we're at a good point. I think we have a, a good uh, theorem which uh, uh, works uh, only for finite systems, a uh, finite number of qubits, uh, but presumably has good chances to be uh, extended. It's not based just on these two postulates. The base of five postulates, uh, out of which the first two are essentially this one, cleaned up, said precisely, and the other ones are very reasonable, like the amount of information is conserved. Um, so, to my surprise, the reconstruction has been working after I failed. <laughs> I, 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 I added the third postulate, basically, is the tool thing. Very, very, very technical and very useful, uh, um, which doesn't have the physical clear interpretation at all. Nowadays, this is working much better, I think. This, in my opinion, reinforces the relational interpretation, but by itself is not a proof of the relational interpretation. It's that. It's just that, look, if you, if you look from this perspective, you might understand better than in this space. Uh, um, and, and vice versa, the relation relation you can take it by itself. But in fact, you can take it itself even not talk about the information. Just by uh, uh, the way we put it, take standard quantum mechanics, this observer, and make it democratic. The observer is, is a guy like, uh, I mean, an electron can be an observer, a star can be an observer, a galaxy can be an observer, a, a, a five atoms can be an observer. Um, and then everything becomes coherent and consistent, provided that you label things to each other. So that's the thing. Uh, uh, I have a question. Three very short questions. One is uh, what is because you spoke of systems and subsystems. So my question is where are the borders and uh, how do I know that this is a system and this is not a system? So what is a non-system? Uh, the second question is about interactions, more or less the same question. What is a non-interaction? How do I know that there is interaction and there is no interaction? And the third one is actually came now from from, from this discussion is. Uh, on which on which uh, level does information stand when you say that when I write a paper and discuss with somebody, then it's it's already it's it, it has some impact. And uh, is is information a non-physical issue or is it a still physical issue linked to something that has has to happen? Because in, in the real information issues we have. I mean, maybe it doesn't fit, but we have computers, we have memories, we have processing, we have codes in order to understand what, what it means. So the, all, all this has to be put aside and just this thing, but somebody has to be able to interpret this and then and, and, and so, 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 okay, how does it fit? Yes, I'm sorry. We go a little bit fast. The first one uh, is actually what two people mean to that. Uh, the first one is how, what is the system? How do you break the... Now, I, I don't need that because uh, Stan Wigner, and I think the friends don't know, 
Uh, there is something magical about quantum mechanics, right? This fact that you can move the boundary between the, what you consider a quantum system and what you consider a classical system, and you can always move it out without changing the final dimensions. If you think this is a spectacular property of quantum mechanics, depending on the fact that um, uh, the either space of two system is a tensor product of two systems and not the sums what you would assume to start with, and the way operators work in tensor product. So the answer to your question is uh, uh, you can take a piece of units and break it into subsystems any way you want. And quantum mechanics works provided that your system is sufficiently large, not too small. If it is too small, you miss the quantum mechanical interaction of what is outside. But anyway, you make it sufficiently large, the predictions are good. Are, 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 are so it doesn't matter. The, 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 the theory says they can all break it into pieces where you are, wherever they are. So separate the use of freedom between them and the That's the so you need energy for that this system. So you need energy is so you need the standard physics. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's yes, true. Um, a similar answer is about uh, interaction. So once again, uh, concretely, what do you mean by you actually formulate the question correctly? What do you mean by non-interaction? Okay. Well, you mean the evolution of this is dependent on the evolution of that. Which means that there is there's no interaction term in any form. So I need a third person. No, no. The, 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 if, if it is true that the future uh, probability distribution uh, is fully determined by this and does not change when, when you make a mistake or something, it does not depend on what you make there, it means that there's no interaction with this concept. Standard claim definition of only interaction with this. Okay, it's a mathematical definition, but anyhow, okay. Romani, if you think that the way okay. Okay. John Bell defines causality, yeah. You can use exactly his notion to say that we need to say What was the second one? The third one was about information. Oh, information! <laughs> well, I can just keep it what we said at the beginning. I use a notion of information which is new. It's correlation, physical correlation. Of course, then there are other notions of information which are far more complicated, eh? like, for instance, a story of information. Or uh, mental meaningful information. Okay. I mean, uh, it, 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 English text has information for me, and Chinese text doesn't. Of course, I'm using a notion of information here, but it's not the same as the distance. It's not complicated. So I'm only using information in that sense. Uh, the, 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 the information in the other senses require uh, much more structure to be defined. A brain that interprets languages and other things. So, so this is an interpretationless uh, notion of information. Right. Correlation. Correlation with the particles. Maybe, maybe the mistake is to use the same name for different things. It's probably a mistake. Somebody complains about that. Uh, now do I have complaints about that all the time. You shouldn't call it information. But the fault is uh, it's uh, it's channel. We wrote this fantastic paper. And he talks about information. But, but just a short uh, uh, then this, exactly the same question like for, for system and for, okay, for interaction uh, can be said about, about, uh, about correlation. Uh, what is non correlation? Non correlation is when the number of possible states of a system is equal to the product of the number of one system times the number of other systems. Okay, so all the answers are mathematical or yeah. physical, so that's... Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's, exactly. That's, 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 yeah. Okay. I have a question about the um, property and notion of time in um, so RQM. I tried to find it in a meaningful way. So uh, if I understand correctly, you simplify the, the core uh, idea is that um, so the different outcomes of one particular experiment can be associated to different observers or kind of different observers might see completely independent outcomes because of some uh, physical reason. Uh, 
But if we could just kind of put this in a very simplified model, like the uh, Schlenger Love experiment, we have an oven that models of atoms coming out, interacting with the Schlenger Love, and I, as observers, think they're reading their particles. I assume that in this interpretation, me in the first time and me the second time count as a different observer. Am I correct? Because then I might see different outcomes. So it means that I might kind of the whole uh, situation and location of me in the kind of say that. No, not necessarily. You might do it that way, but you can also just count to us system one and track and repeatedly in system two. If you do it normal relativistic. If you do quantum gravity, it's a different story. Let's not go into quantum gravity. Okay, not quantum gravity. But, uh, so then, isn't it that... So then how, how it's uh, defined the different outcomes of the experiment? This is... For, 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 for the ones of you who are actually doing an exam, this will be on the... in the final exam. <laughs> So pay attention. <laughs> this is something that's rarely said, and I don't know why, and uh, I think it's spectacular. I think it's a proof that the wave function, the state, is meaningless in quantum mechanics. Or actually, the state is not a real entity in quantum mechanics. This is the story. Uh, this is time. Okay, and uh, you have a, say, a spin system, and you measure the spin in some direction, then in another direction, then in another direction, then in another direction, then in another direction. Okay, so you measure the spin, say, in the z direction, you measure the spin in the x direction, the spin in some theta angle direction, and the spin in some, again, x direction, and then again zeta, and then again zeta, and so on. Okay, and each time you can get plus or minus. Okay? Anyway, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus. Okay? Now, of course, it's probabilistic. So if you repeat this, you don't get the same thing. If you repeat it, plus, this is xz, you have half, half, so maybe suppose next time is minus, 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 plus, but no, this has to be the same. Okay? Suppose you do it many, many times. Sufficient number of times so that you believe you get the probabilities. Right? You do many, many times, so you get the probabilities. So for instance, between z and x, uh, every time you have plus, you have half and half, and minus half and half, so So we have all this list of things. If I give you this table, to you, okay? But I don't tell you if time goes this way or this way. Question, looking at this, can you reconstruct which direction time goes? And the answer is no. You cannot. That's a fact. I mean, you just can sit down and try and convince yourself. Essentially, because uh, uh, the, the, given that the, the probability of having um, of having the same of the opposite here goes like the cosine of the angle between this and this. Uh, square, right? So it's symmetric in one direction or the other. It doesn't, doesn't depend which direction. So the probabilities between these are that don't depend on which direction you go. Fine. So quantum mechanics transition probabilities do don't know which direction the time goes. It's not surprising, but classical mechanics doesn't. Right? Classical mechanics doesn't know direction of time goes. The, the, to, to break the direction of time, you need the uh, thermodynamics, you need Boltzmann. You need irreversibility, low, low initial entropy, you need something that breaks, you need a lot of stuff that with this low initial entropy. There's always, always and only low initial entropy that breaks okay? the, the direction of time. By itself, you don't. Okay? But take a textbook of quantum mechanics and use the textbook for saying what happened between here and here, say between here and here. So there is a time t, let me call ta, and a time td. Here you measure s uh, z, here you measure s x, so here you get the step plus z, here you measure plus uh, x. What's the state in between? Text 
to tell you that the space in between is this much and not that one. But wait a minute, how, how does the state know if the physics doesn't know about the direction of time? Right? The textbook story is that you project on plus, you project on, on, on x, you project on theta. So between here and here is the one you projected in the past. So it's this one. And no plus in direction. But how the hell the physics know if the physics doesn't know the direction of time? It doesn't. So why do we say that? Well, what do we mean by that? We only mean that we, human being, we have memory. So we have low entropy in the past. That's how we have memory. So we live, we are badly time irreversible things, right? Our memory remember the past and not the future. So at the intermediate time here, we have memory of the past. So the state here is just the memory of this. It's not something physical for the spin between the two. Therefore, the state has no direct ontological meaning. I don't know how anybody can beat that. I haven't found any answer to that. I asked the people of the many world interpretation, and their answer is, oh, hmm. There's just no answer to that. Right? Or in other words, many world interpretation state branches. Why branches to the future, not to the past? Who, said, who told the state to do so? Okay. What breaks time reversal invariance? Time reversal invariance in physics is only broken by past law and tool. So of course our memory remember the past and not the future. But the spin system that goes across a, a, a set of Stengerlachs doesn't know anything about entropy, past law entropy, future law entropy. So the state, the notion of this is a physical thing, this is a physical thing, this is a physical thing. The state is just a way of remembering these physical things. That's, I think, how the direction of time comes in the story. Uh, the state at any point is, for, for us, for, for our bookkeeping device, it, it's a bookkeeping device of the past which allows us to make predictions about the future. The retro time being broken by the fact that we are things that remember the past and compute about the future. Just continuing my question, actually, I'm not sure. I have some words to use that terminology. Joe, I want to say that now if we agree that we kind of, uh, as an observer, kind of omit completely this concept of memory, put it away. And then it might be possible that I kind of effectively be able to transfer the concept of quantum probability to the notion of time. And uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a kind of a switching. Then I can kind of uh, predict all the results of the uh, quantum experiment without going to the uh, orthodox uh, undetermined of the measurement. This is kind of can Without going through indeterminism of the measurement. Yeah, the point of this that we don't know why each time the result of experiment will be more kind of, uh, I mean, values, but not uh, predictable as classical uh, physics. But here, if we kind of omit the concept of memory. If we omit the concept of memory, this is what goes on in the world. Okay. Period. And uh, if you have this list of things, uh, it happened to be a fact that given here a minus, you can predict how many times there's a plus or minus here and how many times there's a plus or minus here. If I just give you this list and hide the other, hide this, you can predict the probability distribution of this and this. Yes. It means that That's the only thing that quantum mechanics gives you. The observer doesn't have that, because it seems that uh, always we are kind of, uh, in kind of correlated with the concept of observer, which observer has a memory or is a unitary deterministic. We kind of remember what we, what we detect previously, and we expect that it is the same because all everything is the same. Why don't we can give us different answers? But if we kind of looking at the time or memory of the observer, the third one, per person, 
omit that one, then also don't say that this is also unitary or deterministic, then we, we don't have a problem. And then we can kind of, um, kind of associate this probability to the, that time that we did a measurement. And then um, it, it can, I, I, by understanding how that we can describe it like this. Then each time we have a form of a, uh, each time that we read something, have some um, uh, possibility, so some probability, <laughs> not the effect, not the physics, not the system. I, if, I, if I understand correctly what you say, I agree. I think, <laughs> I think I agree. Yes, I think I agree. You know this paper by Einstein in which he, it's a beautiful short paper by Einstein in which he says that uh, uh, quantum mechanics is indeterministic toward the future but equally also toward the past, right? If you know the present and you want to know the past, you have exactly the same amount of indeterminism toward the, uh, the future. Um. No, sorry. Go so, ahead. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, so yeah. we have to stop now.